So it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce to everyone Professor Carl Henrik Heldin, who is the former chair of the Nobel Foundation and a professor at Uppsala University in Sweden. Professor Heldin, good morning and good day. Thank you very much. Good morning to you too. Thank you so much for being with me here in this interview. And the main purpose of this interview, as you know, is to inspire the next generation of scientists, our future scientists and what I call them, our future leaders. So let's maybe start with with maybe one of the more obvious questions, but I think really important one, what do you think would be the most important advice to younger colleagues coming from a, from a senior and experienced professor such as yourself to have a successful scientific career? Well, I think something which is very important is to find an excellent research group in which you can perform a PhD uh, work. And um, it is of course also important to find a, a group which has a research direction, which is suitable for you. But I think the um, uh, choice of supervisor is even more important because after your PhD thesis, you can always ch uh, choose any direction in science you want. But it is crucial to, to find a, a, an excellent milieu for your, to get a good start in your career. And you yeah, should probably yeah. start to think about that already during your master's studies. If you have the chance to do a master project, that's a fantastic opportunity to try different laboratories to find the one that you really like. Yeah, I mean, that, that's super important advice. And just speaking about the mentor, I can ask a kind of simple question, simple question, but maybe complicated answer. So what, what kind of maybe skill set should an early researcher or characteristics should they look uh, for in a mentor? Do you maybe have any kind of advice? They, should they look for a senior mentor, a young mentor, an ambitious mentor? This is an excellent question, which doesn't really have a very clear answer, because there are advantages and disadvantages with choosing a young versus an old uh, or more senior advisor. Uh, a more senior advisor, of course, has more experience and uh, has learned how to do supervision, hopefully, by having had a number of PhD students before yourself. Um, but maybe also entangled with a lot of administrative duties, maybe also traveling a lot, not being in the lab so many hours. A younger one is, of course, uh, more committed, more eager, devoting more time to um, his or her research group, which is an advantage. But, but of course, being having less experience. So I think you should um, use all your channels to try to find out who in the field have a good reputation. And also, if you attend meetings of various kinds, ask around and uh, try to puzzle together what could be a, a suitable supervisor for you. Yeah, definitely. You know, there, there, there are, you can look at this at, at both sides. And I think you explained this really well. And speaking of the skill set necessary, I mean, you probably had many PhD students and early, early, early young researchers. So, so what do you think is the necessary skill set for that early um, or young scientist to have a relatively successful or really successful career in science? Well, I think this comes in three parts. The first is that you have to have a genuine interest. You have to be devoted to your research. You have to be curious. You really have to burn for science. So that, that is what I would say uh, one very important part. The second very important part is endurance, uh, the ability to deal with failures. Because even successful scientists, most of the time, experience that experiments didn't go the way they should, and there are obstacles, there are problems. And you have to be able to deal with that without being too depressed and start again with new energy. And the third one is, of course, that you have to acquire knowledge in your field of research to know what is known and what is not known and what is a reasonable question to ask and what is an important question to answer as well as uh, learning uh, various methods and techniques that are also needed for your scientific uh, research. Right, right. And I think I think that that's all really great um, um, kind of advice and the skill set you mentioned. And uh, kind of a sub question uh, for young people who are maybe still at medical school or somewhere else who are even before their PhD, what, what should they do? Should they be proactive? What should they do to try to kind of ensure 
or really increase their likelihood of having a su successful scientific career. You mentioned attending conferences, networking with people. What what kind of advice would you give there to really young people? Well, I, I think what you mentioned is important to try to use whatever network you have to, to get information. And also, you know, simple things, choose interesting documentaries on television, you know, broaden your knowledge, uh, look out there what uh, you may find interesting and uh, try to figure out what is not really known yet and where you would like to contribute to where you would like to sort of make some kind of impact yeah i mean de definitely definitely important and, and you know, we, we spoke about you know progress scientific progress successful research career but let's maybe talk um, um the other side of that story which is sometimes you know the, the failures you mentioned which are important for everybody you know to go through and learn but what do you think are the main barriers that stand in the way of this scientific progress that that we've been talking about well if we look at the, from an overall perspective science in general i think the most important is recruitment we need to uh, recruit the most talented young people to science. And here I can see a little bit of a problem because at least in my country, when I started to be a scientist was very prestigious and most of the talented people actually chose that path. Nowadays, there is so many other things that uh, young people find interesting and we have to compete with a, a number of other careers in life. Uh, and I think we are not doing that in a good way we need to do better we need to do everything we can in order to recruit the talents to science and then of course what are the limitations when you actually are in science and then of course money is one such thing in many countries there is enough money for science but it not, need, need not necessarily be uh, allocated correctly so had to have a system which puts money in the best places to let the most talented scientists benefit from it is important. And I think also it is important to devote a substantial portion of the funds available to basic research, to curiosity driven research. Nowadays, there is, at least in my country, a little bit uh, emphasis on innovation, on application, on making uh, jobs out of uh, discoveries. And, and uh, that is important too. But without strong basic science, there will be very little progress in other more applied science. Um, so that's important. And then, of course, to do science, you need time. And what most scientists will uh, encounter when during their career is that there are other things that come in as duties. Teaching, for one thing, and that's okay. We should teach. But too much teaching is, of course, difficult to combine with, with a scientific career. And as you sort of progress in your career, more and more administrative duties will also come up, which takes a lot of time. And that is, of course, a problem. Um, and another problem, which sort of is maybe not related to what you can uh, influence yourself, but which is a, a little bit of a problem, at least in life science, is the problem with the reproducibility in science. Mm -hmm. Some of the most spectacular papers uh, published in the best journals have shown to be difficult to reproduce. And if you can trust science, then we all can come in a very tricky situation. And it's unclear whether these publications are wrong or whether they simply are, have done something really remarkable and difficult that is difficult for others to, to reproduce. But along this line, we have also poor science, you know, um, fake science, even scientific misconduct, which um, um, now there is good tools to sort of follow up and it, which is being done and uh, that is good and absolutely necessary. And I think that is also something that we need to take into account when we think about what sort of are in the way for scientific progress in general. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, th I think the, the problem of reproducibility is very real. And you know, I, I can almost on a daily basis see, see that problem. So we, we definitely should work, should work on that but you, in, in one of the earlier answers you mentioned that kind of younger people really young people still in medical school should potentially even watch you know documentaries about science or a specific topic and i would maybe consider i don't know if you would agree that documentaries would would be considered kind of open access almost science because mm. they're produced and everybody can watch it as long as you have like a subscription to your tv i guess mm. you can watch it 
And, and mm. then speaking of that open access part, how do you think open access and open science in general contributes to early researchers to their careers? Yeah, no, this is very important. And as a university employee, we have three tasks. One is uh, teaching, the second is science, and the third is to make uh, knowledge available to general public. And the third one, we should not forget. So I think this is very important. And uh, after all, science is aiming at producing data, to produce, producing new knowledge. And whatever we produce needs to be available for everyone, scientists as well as the uh, general public. Yeah, de definitely. And and as you know, some of the journals that are out there are maybe not so open access, some are open access, but just kind of a general question. Do you think all journals should be open access in that regard? Or do you think there really, for some journals, should be a mandatory fee for X, Y, or Z reason? I think uh, we need open access. Uh, there is a discussion whether we could allow a six month period or maybe one year period uh, with restricted access just to make the uh, commercial journals uh, have something uh, possibility of surviving. And I would be open to that uh, discussion. But at some point, all data produced need to be open, freely accessed for everyone. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely agree with that point. I think, you know, just having open access, especially to countries, you know, some some countries like maybe Croatia or some other countries don't have just the funds to actually fund that. And I really do think that can hinder progress, especially if you want the latest and greatest um, in science. Professor Heldin, it's been a great pleasure doing this short interview with you. Thank you so much for this. And I really do hope and really do think that many of your answers will inspire the next generation of scientists. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be part of this.